Hello and welcome to the Checking the Gate podcast. I'm Doug. I'm Steve. Steve, introduce yourself a little. You are... I am one of the co-owners slash producers of NSHG Films along with Doug, and I am also the creator, producer, and co-host of the Music A to Z podcast. So why should anyone care about what you have to say <clears throat> about movies? Like, what's your relationship with <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from, like, oh, I guess, yes, you know, yeah, NSHG, NSHG films. films yeah. So and it, we're part of an amateur film production company, and that is because, and it's not because, you know, we don't care about film. It's because we absolutely love film. Uh, I've worked in the exhibitor side of the film industry, so that's the cool professional way of saying I work at a movie theater. Uh, I've been working for nine and a half years now at movie theaters, including um, being the head manager of a of an old-timey single-screen theater. Uh, I've also been part of the independent film community, helping to run various film festivals around Vancouver and such. And uh, I also watch a lot of movies, and have watched a lot of movies, and like enjoy watching movies, like enjoy watching movies yeah I, I like enjoy watching movies as well yeah yeah i'm um, also an opinionated bastard so at times <laughs> <laughs> actually you know to be fair though as far as like opinionated bastards go when it comes to like talking about opinions on the internet you know they're a little more a little more well balanced than, than a lot of people will say <laughs> that's because i'm so afraid of making people hate me that i always try to like be fair to the other side which is ridiculous, because everyone hates you already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to make it worse. <laughs> Did I mention he's my brother? I don't know if we mentioned that yet. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. I don't know. People may have caught on, because our voices are, are somewhat similar. Today, we are going to be talking about the movie The Black Hole, from 1979. Directed by Gary Nelson, who... What else has Gary Nelson done? Well, you know, it seems like not... A whole lot as far as movies go. He was mostly a television film director. Patty Duke Show, Gunsmoke, Gillian's Island, Happy Days. Well, he did do Freaky Friday. And this would be the, the 70s ones. So this is the one with Jamie Lee Curtis. No, sorry, wait. Sorry, Jamie Lee Curtis was the mom in the remake. No, no this is Jody the one with Jodie Foster. Jodie right. Foster, yeah. Which apparently is the definitive one. Yeah, and that was before The Black Hole. So, they, I mean, that one must have been a hit. So well, Disney, okay, so Disney liked him. Disney trusted him. They're like, hey, man, good job. This is interesting. Yeah, later in the, in the 80s, he re- directed a movie called Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold. It, As I, a sequel. It really looks like it's trying to capitalize on Indiana Jones. Like, a lot. Is this Disney? Canon film distributors. So, like, a, yeah, low budget. Yeah. Yeah, the director didn't really do a whole lot of um, movies, and it looks like this, the black hole actually probably ended his movie career, <laughs> Which unfortunately. Is, that's kind of unfortunate, because I, I, I don't think there was anything necessarily wrong with the direction of this movie, mm-hmm. and any criticisms I would have would be in casting, script writing, and effects production. Well, I guess let's, let's talk about the synopsis. Yeah. Um, so, the Black Hole, there's a, a ship uh, called the Palomino. They're returning to Earth. They come They come across a ship that was long since forgotten that's been... Uh, it, it's not being pulled into a black hole. It's really close, but there's... there's For some whatever reason, like, it, it's, it's... Yeah, it's, it's on the verge of the event horizon, but yeah. it isn't... It is stationary, which is strange. Also, coincidentally, the uh, token woman crew member of the Palomino, her father was aboard that ship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the token female. I like that. That's entirely what she was. <laughs> no, it's true, though. I guess this is before they had token black guys. Um, I think they were. I think Disney just did it. Actually, oh, no. Uh, no, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they go on to the... Uh, into oh, the sorry. Station. Hold on. Can you imagine if this film was a black exploitation film? You know, the, the black, black hole. hole. The, the black, black hole. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go aboard that ship. He's coming aboard, <laughs> and there's no stopping him. Dun, dun, black hole. <laughs> oh man, I would buy that movie. <laughs> okay. I would too, actually. I mean, I have mixed feelings. Uh, about uh, how uh, what the quality of the movie would be, but um, <laughs> but there would be entertainment value. So they board the uh, the ship called the Cygnus. It, the entire crew is gone. It's run but entirely by robots, and the one survivor, a brilliant scientist named Hans Reinhardt. Reinhardt. Then there's some questions. There's... They say what happened to the rest of the crew because there was a significant crew on board, 
and he said, oh, yeah, there was some, ser- like, we were stuck on the black hole, and I and I ordered them all to, to, to get out of here and to get away as fast as they can, so they boarded the escape pods. And I can't remember if he said that they he didn't know if they got away or if he, they were sucked in to the black hole. I can't quite remember. But he said that he had sent them away, and off they had gone. And he and he was going to stay behind and edit it. And the captain, and the, not the captain. Was the captain the dad or whatever? He had elected to stay with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the, it was the token female's father. Yeah, and he stayed um, with. And I don't remember what the excuse was. Well, I need this to say, uh, Reinhardt gives some really, some really somewhat plausible but pretty flimsy excuses as to why the crew are gone. Yeah, for that, I guess what would you say is the is like the film really about? Uh, the film is about how Disney can make two thousand one <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> No, the, no, I know what they're going for. I, it's not. I'm not being completely facetious when I say that this is a remake of 2001. When 2001 came out, it was it was a new way of viewing science fiction and space movies. They were always they were always kind of cheesy beforehand. They were always just they were for like teen boys. They were for the science fiction movies were for teen boys. They usually had uh, a, like kind of a horror element at the bug eyed aliens. And then 2001 came along, and it was more than that. It was a very adult film. It was very cerebral. There wasn't a bug eyed alien. Uh, there was an alien but was it a menace or was it a guiding hand that was completely ambiguous and there was a sense of wonder and a sense of of the great majesty of space and then films afterwards tried to duplicate that and this is one of those films where they start they said we want to capture again that feeling of how amazing space is and how little we actually know about space how it's the the uh, the new frontier, you know, likening it to westerns, you know, where where settlers from Europe were, were coming out, and it was the great expanse, and who knows what were in the wilds, you know, recapturing that sort of western western science fiction glory. And there is this sort of, I think it does actually somewhat succeed in capturing that sort of, the contemplative sense of wonder and awe in space. I mean, it, it isn't... Uh, I mean, in some ways, I mean, I like the pacing a lot better than I did 2001. Yeah, but, well, um, I mean, they're, they're marketing. I mean, Kubrick alone. He, Kubrick likes long-winded <laughs> films. I mean, he really does. Um, yeah. Whereas, like, Disney's a little more like, okay, well, let's let's talk about who our target audience is. Well, at this point, Disney, Disney was still extremely family movie-centric. Yeah. In fact, this movie was a huge leap for them. Yeah. Because it was the first movie they released with a PG rating instead of the G rating. Mm-hmm. So, this was them trying to be bold, new, and adventurous, but still Disney. Um, so you, you, you can tell, actually, that there's a conflict here between... I don't think they properly knew who their target audience was at this point. I don't think they, they really got it because there are scenes that are really, really, too, really kid friendly, like you know, especially with the, the robots. Oh yeah, the robots uh, doing the laser sparring, and, and it, was, yeah. it was just kind of silly. And... and then there's there's some grisly adult stuff, like when the the scientist at the end he get uh, Maximilian eviscerates him. I mean, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. And it's, I think that's perhaps one of the ways that the movie fails is that. It doesn't quite uh, know who its audience is, and it has a very inconsistent tone. Uh, kind of like Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. You know, actually, I didn't watch that one. Don't don't bother. Yeah, I heard I heard mm-hmm. enough mixed things where I'm just like, well, well, it's got the same sort of thing. Some things are really, really like juvenile, really juvenile, and other things are strangely macabre. What's strange about me is that I'm more willing to see things in the theaters than like take the time to to rent them or see them at home which is uh, unless they're on netflix or mm. something like that so when it was in theaters i was in like the midst of film school and i just did not have time to go watch alice in wonderland if i had heard like praised reviews for it i probably would have made more time for it but like i heard such mixed things mostly negative uh some people were positive but but that's neither here nor there but definitely one of the things that this film tried to do was it tried to be very kind of like philosophical and have and have some moral dilemmas and and a, a lot of ethics uh issues i think is i i think that there were so many ideas in this that it almost i feel like it, it only skimmed the surface of a lot of these ideas and didn't really like delve into them because of of a a relatively short runtime yeah um i mean i mean i guess i mean 98 minutes is pretty healthy but i well you if know. you're trying to do like a science fiction epic i would think two hours would be would be fair I'm, and, and again, I'm not. I'm not necessarily saying that every movie has to have the same pace as 2001. But you're right. There were just a lot of a lot of a lot of ideas, and also they they spent some time pissing around. Like again, with your, yeah. the, the <laughs> where they're doing the laser sparring, and the robots are all like shooting targets and stuff like that. And they're like, oh yeah, this this uh, this robot here, Star. He used to be like the the top robot till Maximilian came in. That went nowhere. Yeah, you know, there you was think, you think nothing it would. about that. 
so it was just literally it was just wasting time so you take those time wasting scenes that padding you take that out then you're left with an even shorter runtime to communicate some of these ideas so i mean i mean essentially i guess it's you know what i almost compare it to like governments misusing funds it's, it's like <laughs> is is like if, if the money the money sometimes is there they're spending it poorly the time the running time is there mm -hmm. they're just using it poorly <laughs> they, yeah. they could have just like they could have like worked on like the bigger story, but instead like we had a scene where the robots are holding a funeral for for one of the other robots. There was a lot more potential in the story to do those kind of things, where you were seeing robots doing strangely human customs. I would have liked to have seen more of that to lead to an overall mystery. It's like you know what, guys, I just saw this this robot funeral, and then I also saw that this robot was in the bathroom and he was going. He started a shower and he was about to step in. And then he stopped and turned it off, and you know, just th th things like that, where people, where the the crew of the Palomino are going around, they're like, "What is going on with these robots? What? Why are they doing these human customs?" I would have definitely liked to see that explored more, because one of the things I think that this movie does touch on is the blurring of human life and artificial intelligence. Because the crew, they treat the Vincent is the is the uh, is their the crew's robot yeah. off of the Palomino, voiced by Roddy McDowell. God bless you, Roddy McDowell. He, they they want to treat him just as if he's one of them. Yeah. Um, and that's even mentioned very early on. He's like, he is one of us. But meanwhile, like the spoiler alert, the crew of the Cygnus mm -hmm. have been turned into into robot drones. Yeah, they were lobotomized by by uh, Reinhardt. It almost argues that Vincent is more human than than the the original crew of the Cygnus have become. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's very that's an interesting idea, and but I do, I feel like. It wasn't as implied as it should have been, perhaps. I mean, there's there's an interesting scene at, near the end where we see Reinhardt has gone to hell, basically. And he's trapped within the shell of his robot, Maximilian. Which is kind of actually kind of funny because the actor playing Reinhardt is Maximilian Shell. But he's, he's, he's <laughs> trapped within within this... <laughs> but, no, it's true, though. He's, he's trapped within yeah. the, the, the shell of, of Maximilian the robot. Uh, and that's, that's actually kind of a very interesting an interesting sort of idea in that like he lobotomized his crew turning them basically into robots and then he has to spend the rest of eternity in the trapped within the shell of a robot of his own design could he use more of that in the film though i mean not him trapped in the robot but more 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 of what we're talking about here more of just this this uh blending of of uh the boundary between artificial life and and human yeah i think uh, i think there's a lot of potential in the ideas but unfortunately, the screenplay is is just too limited in what it was able to, to get across. I think, yeah, a little bit more of a runtime and using the and using that runtime well would have probably saved the movie. Um, but you know, at the same time, I don't know if this is the. I mean, because uh, this is one of the uh, the big tanks of uh, of Disney history, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and and one of those issues is that I think that maybe it came out at the wrong time because this was 1979. Yeah. Post Star Wars, looks like December. So this was Christmas after season. after Star Trek the Motion Picture, and it's like just after same year. Younger audiences wanted more Star Wars. Yeah, older audiences were getting better films like, well, I don't know if I'd say Star Trek the Motion Picture is a better film. Well, uh, we'll, we'll say this about Star Trek the Motion Picture though: the, the tone was at least consistent. Oh, it was extremely. It consistent. was it was an adult movie, start to finish. Yeah. And also that year, uh, Alien. Alien came out, so too. There was, that was a, an amazing science fiction film for adult audiences. And also remember, Star Trek Motion Picture first came out. The fans, fans were really pleased with it. And, and it grossed huge numbers. Okay, so, so it, was, I, it, was, it was actually a success. It, it was a success because then otherwise, if it wasn't a success, then there wouldn't have been any more Star Trek movies or Next Generation. So, I mean, it was successful. It's, it's really more with, with hindsight when we were able to see how much better the Star Trek franchise got. Um, I think that, at that point, the fans were just so happy to see it back. Well, exactly, right? Yeah. Exactly. And then, and I guess it was when Wrath of Khan came out, they're like, hey, wait a minute. This, <laughs> this is way better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we can talk about Star Trek movies another day. Um, you know, so... and I, I feel kind of bad, too, because from a production aspect, you, they wanted to get ILM, and ILM wasn't available, and so they actually did some revolutionary se uh, special effects here. Uh, they developed the ACES system, which was... Uh, what's it called? It's called Automated Camera Effects System. Okay. And a matte scan system, which... Uh, and this is the first time they did this, where you could have the camera move, 
while there was action in front of a, a matte background. And to be honest, I, I actually need to look into that because I don't know how the hell they, you can do that. Oh, no idea. Like, I have no idea how um, that works. There's a lot of old filmmaking techniques that baffle me just to how, how spoiled we are. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, um, it, they had to be so inventive and innovative with... Uh, with in-camera techniques. Yeah, and nowadays, like you can do so much in post-production with a with a home program that uh, like that it, it's bewildering uh, the old the old school movie techniques. So I mean, you know, when I say that there's some faults in production, it's it's not for systems like that. It's just like say the look of some of the robots. Like, well, yeah, that's, that's the thing is that like it, just like the tone of the movie, the, the special effects are inconsistent. Mm-hmm. A lot of the the spaceship stuff was really good. Yeah, the model work was good, but the the robots seem so rudimentary. Especially like again, post Star Wars, mm-hmm. uh, Vincent looks like a kid's toy compared to R two D two, and like an R two D two, like it's not a, an amazing design, but it, but it looks but it looks like a robot. It looks functional. Yeah, it looks like a functional robot with purposes. Vincent, it looks he looks like a, he looks like a cartoon character. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, and a very impractical one too. Why would you design a robot character who's a main character in the movie that propels itself through hovering? Why not have him move along on the ground? Because if you're propelling yourself by hovering, then you have to say, okay, now we've got all these logistical special effects that we have to do. We have to do wire work. We have to do trick shots. You know, because we have to propel this illusion that he's hovering along the ground. <laughs> um, so it's like, why not just have him go on the ground on wheels then, you know? Yeah. Say, or say, hey, you know, he moves because he's got magnets and stuff. That way he can be upside down and stuff. Uh, yeah, so that that baffled me. It's like, why would you make an obstacle for yourself? Yeah, I don't know. And even the even the bigger robots, they seem very clunky. and uh, Or they just look kind of like costumes. Um, Maximilian, I think, was one of the better designs. Yeah. Yeah, all in all, it's, it's strange that like the visual effects for the spaceship is the, the spaceships are so much more uh, just just so much stronger than the it's probably where they blew all their money. Oh yeah, you know quite possibly. This movie definitely they uh, they apparently put a lot of effort into merchandising it and and, and trying to pop, uh, try to basically trying to get people in the theater, but it just didn't really take off. Kind of sad actually, because uh, I mean. As much as like we can, as much as flawed as it is, it is still to kind of remains a fascinating movie to me. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I, I I had never seen it uh, beforehand. So only only somewhat recently. I think I caught it a few times on TV mm. as a kid, but I don't think I ever watched it start to finish. I think I've never seen the beginning of it until I sat down uh, with the DVD recently. Yeah, but there is still something about it that really is is, is fascinating. Um, although the the science. Mm-hmm. Is, is, I mean, that's one of the big flaws I think of the film is yeah. that is the, the 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 science is all like it's really bad. Yeah, there there are times where they're going outside the ship, like it, when they're they've passed the near the end, they've passed the event horizon. They're on their way towards the black hole. They're trying to get into like an escape pod or whatever, mm-hmm. and they climb outside of the ship without spacesuits to get into the the escape pod. It's like, wait, what's just what's going on here? Problem is that the action it, it is a little muddled, mm-hmm. and so it's hard to tell like when exactly they're uh, exposed to space. <laughs> yeah, and when they're and and uh, I mean, you know, all, honestly, all it takes is is uh, the most basic scientific consultant to sit down and say like, okay, if he's been sucked out this far, he's gone. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like there's no there's no retrieving him, uh, and and if okay, if this is breached. Then it should it it should be like they shouldn't be able to survive this. And I mean, and to be fair, like some of it looked good on camera. Yeah, like, uh, some of the effects did look really good, but it just it's all seemed very. I think at this point in time, even like mentally, we kind of have a, a, a an understanding of what happens when hulls are breached in space, and and none of this like it, it all looked wrong. Like on this level, like it, it just it seemed weird and wrong. And you know, the the thing is too is that. Even from a practical standpoint, if you want to include all those cool effect shots, just have, like, a quick 10-second scene where they're like, okay, quick, let's get to the escape pod. Oh, just in case, let's put on these spacesuits. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Mm. Put on these spacesuits, and then, you know, do your deer running. Yeah, because, I mean, and then there you go. they have spacesuits on, and there's robots with them. If they're yeah. just, if you know, it, it, there's, there's ways. There's ways around it, <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have to take They don't have to work. be big, clunky spacesuits. They can be... You know, sleek little sexy, sexy skin tight things. Just as long as like there's an establishment that you know they've got a helmet thing, and then just in case the hull breaches, which, in fairness, it already was breaching. There was already meteors like like shredding the bloody ship. Yeah. So yeah, it's not like they they wouldn't wouldn't ever consider it. I don't know. Apparently, they're planning a remake. Oh, of course they are. Um, 
by from the director of uh, Tron Legacy. Yeah, he also did um, Oblivion. He's a very visually oriented director. Mm-hmm. Like that is his strong suit, and that he can he can pull some very visually interesting things. And it's written by. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a little unsettling though. Uh, one of the one of the original writers of Prometheus. John well, the original script apparently was was really good. It was the the guy from Lost who came in and did the rewrites. Oh, really, David Lindelof. Yeah, that really screwed Prometheus. Oh, well, see, that's kind of sad because I know David Lindelof is apparently notorious for being that kind of screenwriter who opens who opens doors and doesn't shut them. <laughs> you know, like asks more questions than he answers. And Prometheus was riddled with that, and apparently yeah. Lost was as well. Yeah, um, I know I haven't seen Lost, but I heard that the original screenplay for Prometheus was was. It didn't leave this very confusing Alien prequel thing because I mean they set it up so that it looks like it leads right into Alien afterwards, but which is completely asinine because in Alien they're like oh these well they say it's been they've been mummified for millions of years or something like that. I mean it, it's it makes no sense as an Alien prequel. No, it doesn't. Yeah, and but apparently the original screenplay was much better. So I'm hoping I'm hoping that's the case. See that that's one of those cases where like a, a screenplay gets like. Overthought out yeah. to the point where it, it kind of, it, I mean, to the point where it kind of doesn't make sense anymore, <laughs> which is, which is kind of. Sad. That was my problem with Prometheus. I really liked it at first, but then you know, the more I looked back at it, and it didn't help too that my theater was playing it for a little bit, so I would see these scenes, certain scenes over and over again, and the more I watched, it, I was just like, no, there's just so many problems that that when you start to think about it, the problems yeah. keep popping up. I felt that about Star Trek Into Darkness as well. Like mm. when I watched it. I was like, hey, this is really, I'm really into this. But then it just like, but if the story just didn't stand up, mm-hmm. I'm just sort of sitting there and like, you know what? No, this isn't working for me. Why isn't this working? <laughs> I would have just changed the last act entirely. Of Star Trek? And Into Darkness, yeah. yeah I thought yeah. the first couple acts were fun. Yeah, you know, I think that is where it started to fall apart. Yeah. Again, promises that weren't kept, I'd say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, back on to, on the subject. What, uh, what would you say is the thing that worked the best for you in this film? Honestly, the model work. Oh, the model yeah. work and the effects of the black hole and stuff. Yeah, they look good. Yeah, actually, to be honest, because I have, I have no complaints about those at all. Even, like, some of the casting I have issues with the model work. <laughs> uh, is funny. Yeah, you know, I don't recognize a lot of these cast members. Uh, Roddy McDowell is the name I know the best. Apparently, Ernest Borgnine. Like, oh, yeah, Ernest, Ernest Borgnine, yeah. Um, I, mean, for, I mean, I don't know much of what he's done, but, I mean, it's just a name that I still knew. From. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think one of the things that I liked the best... I mean, I guess I still, still like, I really respect it conceptually. Mm. And uh, and that's uh, sort of why I'm uh, disappointed is that, like, there's so much it could have done, and it only touched on it. So, I don't know, that's sort of, like, the thing I like and dislike about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> is that part of me wants to like it so much more. You know, one of the things I didn't like, I'm just going to straight out say it, Bob. Mm. The, 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 the hick... Like the hick robot? robot? Yeah. yeah. I was like, why would you program a robot to sound like a hick? That doesn't even make any sense. You see, Vincent had a bit of an English accent. Mm-hmm. I can kind of get that with people programming it so he would, mm-hmm. because there's sort of this... Because this, uh, he's un- like their butler. He's like their butler. Yeah. It shows like some level of intelligence and... But I just couldn't get behind like Bob the the like oh I'm not gonna make it guys it just it just like... <laughs> oh that's because he's a cartoon character again I mean yeah yeah so yeah I think but yeah back to what I like I like I like the ambition of the movie mm-hmm. I like what it was they were hoping it would be and enough of that gets through that I didn't feel like it was a waste of time watching it so that that's what I like the most. Well, I guess what I disliked uh, the most was... I mean, I, I expressed Bob, and... I, yeah, you know, I, I think we already touched on it. Just, like, the inconsistency of the tone and the and the runtime that I felt was... Oh, Anthony um, Perkins. He was Norman Bates in Psycho. Oh, okay. Well, who, who did he play? I think he was the, um... Doctor, oh, no, no, Dr. Alex, Alex Durant. Durant. Okay. Which one was Alex Durant? Uh, well, he, well, he was the guy who actually really liked uh, Reinhardt and wanted to, like, oh, stick yeah. with him, right? And yeah. he was the, the, the follower guy. Uh, yeah, that's astounding. Yeah. Um, he, the, one of his first lines where he's talking about the black holes, like, nothing can escape it, not even light, hmm. um, was sampled in a Hive song, uh, <laughs> Cyclone. <laughs> so well, I guess what was, your, what was the, your least favorite part of the movie? I guess ultimately the thing that irks me is they were, they were first going for the cerebral science fiction movie, which I'm totally on board with, and then in like... Not even the last act, but at, at some point they decide that they're going to be Buck Rogers. 
or whatever. <laughs> and then then this this cheesy action sequence where the the, the token woman's going to be lobotomized, and then Captain Action Hero has to come in and start shooting things, and everybody's shooting at him and missing, and he's got perfect aim or whatever. And the thing that really bothered me, the musical score, and you know, the music for the most part I think is pretty good. Yeah. But the musical, the music at that part is just so cheesy. It's so cheeseball. Actually, you know, worth mentioning the music. Uh, you had lent me the DVD, and I plugged it in and went to get myself a drink, and it must have started auto playing uh, right away. Oh yeah. Because then like the, the music, uh, I hear music, thing. and it doesn't sound like a DVD menu because it just keeps going. And I look over, and it's just like a star field. I'm like. Oh God! Another overture. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I kept forgetting about the overture, but yeah, it's just it, this is apparently one of the last movies that had one. Yeah. This one and Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Yeah, and um, Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Again, I'm I'm not a big Star Trek: The Motion Picture fan. I, I think it's okay. Mind you, I've only ever seen the director's cut. Apparently, the theatrical cut is way longer. Whoa, uh, whoa, I know. I can't even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I was okay with an overture for that because that was the tone they were going for. Whether they succeeded or not, throughout the movie, that was the tone they were going yeah, for. Yeah, I bet. That, I mean, really, in some ways, half the movie was an overture. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, right? <laughs> However, with this movie, with the black hole, you have an overture, this nice space is mystic, magical, you know, space is da- but dangerous, and, uh, you know, there's danger ahead. And then, you know, cut to an hour later, and you've got, you got freaking Flash Gordon... You know, diving over machinery and the yeah, and then, cheesy, cheesy. And then they go right like full space odyssey. Yeah, and then time. they go through and, through a black hole, which it, it, and then there's a psychedelic sequence, not nearly as long, thankfully. Yeah, but uh, but they yeah. go through heaven, they go through hell, and, and they, yeah, a lot of so yeah. I mean, it tried to be so much. Yeah, and and that 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 kind of irks me, but I do remember that that particular scene standing out. Like I understand it, like a, a sequence where we got to get off the ship because the ship's going to go through the black hole and we're going to be shredded. But just the whole, oh, I've got to save her. I can't leave her behind. Oh, I'm a perfect space action hero. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, <laughs> and that was irksome. Okay, well, I guess the uh, last question is, uh, who would you recommend it to? Or what would you recommend it and who would you recommend it to? I would recommend it to anybody who uh, likes likes to watch science fiction films. I would give a caveat. I'd say, look, there's a couple things you should know about it. There are a couple things that are really dated. But... Uh, like I already have recommended it to a couple people, not as you really like this movie, but it's worth it's worth a watch because again, there's some really innovative special effects, and it's an interesting piece of uh, Disney film history. Yeah. Uh, between this and uh, is it Tron? And uh, I think in one other movie, Disney was just having a hard time trying to like find a target target audience for the dis- distribution, so they wound yeah. up forming Touchstone, saying, okay, if we want to release adult more adult material, here's a distributor that we are going to release it through. Uh, so in, in terms of like film history and stuff like that, it's it's good. It's a good good stepping stone. I would agree. I, I'd recommend it to people who are are very interested in sci-fi, with a little bit of a disclaimer saying like, look, it's not perfect. Yeah, it's not a great um, movie. It's not. It's but, but it's yeah. But I also believe that like watching movies that don't succeed. Yeah. Sometimes you can learn just as much from watching ones. That yeah, do. absolutely. I mean, you and it's it is it is good for discussion. It is good for for discussion. About some of the things that they did touch on. I mean, I mean, yeah, no, this this thing where you got the robot who's more human than these lobotomized humans who are acting as robot. I mean, that's that was all interesting stuff. Yeah. And this this notion of hey, we're passing through a black hole. It's actually a wormhole, and it's taken us sort of Event Horizon, the film Event Horizon, like that, where it passes through heaven and hell. Um, I mean, you know, that's that's all. That's fine. That's, yeah. that's good stuff. It's 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 actually it is a very fascinating movie. So, uh, what would you give it out of five if you had to rate it two? Yeah, I'm kind of leaning two or two point five. I might go with a two as well. Two out of five. Yeah, because it just it isn't it isn't it doesn't feel right to slam it no. entirely. But it is, it also doesn't feel like it's worth praising. Max Millen Shell gave a pretty good performance. He he had a good type of paranoia. He didn't have the whole everyone's out to get me sort of mentality that most paranoids are depicted in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, that's true. When, what's-his-face, the doctor, uh, when Norman Bates was <laughs> saying, you know, you know, <laughs> you're a genius Bates. or whatever, he never thought, oh, this guy's actually secret out, secret out to me. He's like, hey, you actually appreciate my work. In fact, he was pretty ticked off when Maximilian axed him. Yeah, I, although this is a problem I have, Shell. For the love of God, if you're going to make a robot, you want a robot that will obey your orders e- absolutely immediately. Yeah. If, if you want your robot to be able to kill people, that's fine. But if you say, no, Max, stop, that robot should stop and shut down you're the one who designed it. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not a fault of the movie. This that's just like I guess it could nitpick. be argued that maybe like Maximilian the robot was 
getting more self awareness, maybe. I yeah, don't know. But yeah, then again, sure. like this is all stuff that I, you can speculate on. It wasn't really explained in the film. Yeah, a little more focus. I mean, if, if there is a remake, I would definitely go see it. I'd be Just, really curious to see how they do it. Cause, yeah, because I think that the mistakes made in this one were probably learned from. Yeah, they might make new mistakes, <laughs> like like I think they did with Tron Legacy. As if it's the same director, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, but I'd definitely be curious to see it. Cool. I mean, I guess uh, we're pressed for time, so I think that, uh, you know, we actually touched on a lot in a fairly quick amount of time. So uh, thanks for thanks for recording with me today. No problem. Thanks and for having me. We will uh, we'll touch on some other films in the near future, I'm sure. So thanks so much for listening to the Check in the Gate podcast. I'm Doug. I'm Steven. And moving on.